yourself plenty of time. It's always a good idea, yeah. Yeah.
Welcome to the Crane School of Music. To ensure a pleasant concert experience for both audience and performers, please turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices and refrain from using them for the duration of the concert. Also, recording devices are not allowed without the express permission of the performers. In the event of an emergency, please follow the marked exits and move away from the building until instructed to return. We hope that you enjoy today's performance. Good evening and welcome to the fall 2019 Joy Anthony Douglas Visiting Master Teacher Keynote Address given tonight by the esteemed scholar Dr. Julia Aklund Koza from the University of Wisconsin. I'm Karen Collins, Chair of the Music Education Department and I would like to thank all of you who are here tonight in person or watching on our live stream for coming. Also a most sincere thank you goes to our committee who worked together to make this event possible, including Drs. Mark Campbell, Andrea Moss, Nils Clicken, uh, Emmett O'Leary, and Peter McCoy. I would also like to recognize our Master Teacher Crane alumni who are working with Dr. Koza this week leading workshops and forums. John Bernstein, Genevieve Brigida, Catherine Ta, Benjamin Reibolt, and Kevin Timms. Dr. Koza and our master teachers will be presenting three more open forums that you are invited to attend. Tomorrow at 2 p.m. in Bishop Hall C-123, and tomorrow also at 4 p.m. in Wakefield Recital Hall, and then Thursday at 10 a.m. in Shooty Hall A320, the Curriculum Lab. Be sure to pick up a flyer at the uh, conclusion of this address tonight in the lobby of this theater, and you will find some light refreshments there as well. It'll be a description of the open forums that you all are invited to attend. At this time, I would like to turn over the podium to our Crane School of Music, Dean Michael Sitton. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to welcome you both to the start of an exciting semester at SUNY Potsdam and Crane and to the fall 2019 Joy Anthony Douglas Master Teacher Residency. I'd like to say a word about that as we start. Our alumna, Joy Anthony Douglas, who was from the Crane class of 1956, felt so strongly about the influence of her learning experience at Crane, especially what she gained from the masterful teaching of Helen Hosmer and Mary English, that she wanted to make it possible for Crane students now and in the future to hear regularly from master teachers who are invited to the campus to share their insights and experience. To this end, along with her husband, Chet, Joy established the Joy Anthony Douglas Master Teacher Fund, which, since 2012, has enabled us to, ho to host a wide variety of guests, including many of our own alumni, such as those that Dr. Collins just mentioned, to present their ideas to our students. Tonight's event in the Douglas series launches a residency focusing on gender and equity in music education, which includes both our distinguished guest speaker and a panel of Crane graduates, again, you, you heard about that, who are currently teaching in K-12 schools. In some ways, this is a, an extension of the spring 2019 Douglas residency, which included many of those same alumni and focused on broad issues of equity and inclusion. And I hope you'll take advantage of some of the opportunities tomorrow that Dr. Hahn spoke about. I'd also like to mention that this serves in a timely way to help Crane launch a year-long celebration of women in music. We've taken the occasion of the centennial of women's suffrage in the United States to celebrate the work of women in many facets of musical life. Throughout the year, we will host many events where you'll hear music by women, hear about women in lectures and other events, and focus on the role women have played in music. Tonight's event helps us ask important questions about gender and music education and how we consider this important topic going forward. This could not be more fitting for a school founded by a woman who had the leading vision of her time for music education. A number of Crane faculty have led in this initiative and I'd especially like to acknowledge the work of Dr. Aaron Brooks. 
The Crane Faculty Gala, with which we traditionally open our concert season, takes place next Tuesday, September the 3rd at 7.30 in Hosmer Hall, and that concert will feature numerous works by women as another way to launch the centennial celebration. I hope you will join us there and for many other events throughout the year. I'd like to acknowledge uh, two campus leaders that we're pleased to have with us tonight in the audience, our Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Betty Bergeron, and Associate Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer, Dr. Bernadette Tiapo. Would you thank them for being here? And it's my pleasure now to welcome the president of SUNY Potsdam, Dr. Kristen Esterberg, who will introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Esterberg. Thank you, Dean Sitton, and welcome, welcome, welcome. It is my great and distinct pleasure to welcome to SUNY Potsdam's Crane School of Music, Julie Kosa. Professor Julie Kosa is a professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction and the School of Music at Mead Witter School of Music. She is a faculty affiliate in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies, and she teaches in the area of music education and multicultural education. She was chair of the music education area from 1998 to 2014. Founder of the Consortium for Research on Equity in Music Education, which is an international cross-cultural initiative that fosters equity research in music education, she twice served as chair of UW-Madison's Committee on Women in the University. Her widely published music uh, research focuses on equity issues in education, on music and music education, as well as on corporate influence on music education policy. Professor Koza began her teaching career in River Falls, Wisconsin, where she taught vocal and general music in the public schools. So please help me give a very warm Crane School of Music welcome to Professor Julie Koza. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. If you can't, I can't see you, so you'll have to yell and say, we can't hear you, Julia. I, 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 there, there are no faces out there. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, I want to thank the sponsors and organizers of this uh, visiting professorship for giving me the opportunity to spend time with you this week. I had a wonderful afternoon uh, with uh, undergraduate and graduate students. And I want to begin um, by acknowledging the Mohawk Nation and their ancestors and expressing thanks for the privilege of teaching on ground where Potsdam now stands that people have called home for at least 5,000 years. I'm not proud of uh, how people like me came to occupy this land, but I am honored to be part of the long legacy of teaching and learning here. And um, for the, uh, the last several years, I have started every, the beginning of every semester acknowledging the Ho-Chunk Nation in Wisconsin because UW-Madison sits on ground where people have lived for 12,000 years. And sometimes our narratives, especially in music education, don't acknowledge that history. I'm also going to give you a warning. For the first time in my academic career, in almost 35 years, I may run over my allotted time. Uh, uh, in, in, I understand if at the hour you have to leave, if you have childcare obligations or something, I understand. Uh, uh, and if you're willing to stay for a Q&A, I'm not going anywhere afterward and I was told the venue is open and, and maybe we can turn off the, the house lights and we can have a conversation. So I'm, I'm, I'm forewarning you, I have a, a, it's a complicated story I want to tell you and I didn't want to leave out any pieces. So the charm, oh, let's, let's go back. How did this happen? This is charm of an educated woman thinking intersectionally about sexism and the racial contract. I'm really honored uh, to be helping launch this year-long celebration of the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in the United States. Uh, my talk tonight is in keeping with the focus of this residency on gender. Uh, 35 years ago, uh, my research journey began with studies of gender equity in music and music education, and over the years, the journey has expanded uh, as my work has expanded to include, among other things, race equity. 
This evening, I'm going to take you back 100 years and talk about some other things happening at about the same time that women got the vote in the United States. Things that have had a profound impact on, uh, on the United States and on disciplines, uh, on the disciplines of music and music education to the present. 2019 marks the 100th anniversary of the publication of the Seashore Measures of Musical Talent, the first standardized tests of musical ability, which were developed by the music psychologist Carl Seashore. This week, I'm giving a series of lectures on a book I recently finished, and it's in review, that talks about Seashore, and the thread tying most of my lectures together this week is how eugenics uh, not only shaped Seashore's work, but also has touched and continues to touch uh, not merely society in the United States, but more importantly, education, specifically music education. I hope tonight's talk demonstrates the importance of thinking intersectionally and interdisciplinarily. In using the term intersectionally, I am relying on Kimberly Crenshaw's groundbreaking work, which came at a time when gender was being studied in one academic corner and race in another, and Crenshaw called for studies of how discourses and practices concerning gender and race intersect with each other. The concept of intersectionality has later come to encompass social class and other characteristics as well. I also want to underscore the importance of thinking interdisciplinarily. Um, I hope my, my work tonight will demonstrate how important it is for music and music education scholars to consider ideas, research, and sources from outside of the music fold. The story I'm going to tell unfolds in sources outside of music and music education, and if scholars stick to conventional music sources, they probably will miss it. Pro uh, previous scholars have done precisely that. Um, but nevertheless, the story impact, has an impact on what happens inside music and music education. So, let's go to the next slide. My interest in eugenics and in the story I'm, I'm about to tell began with a hunch. In 2003, Stephen Selden, a renowned expert on eugenics and education, spoke at UW-Madison in my department, which is curriculum and instruction, about the better baby and fitter family contests that were being held at state and county fairs throughout the Midwest during the first quarter of the 20th century. Just as livestock were judged in the barns, babies and whole families were judged in nearby tents, the fittest being awarded medals. Selden reported that these contests were sponsored by the American Eugenics Society. I had never heard of that organization. Selden was on the advisory panel for the recently created website Image Archive on the American Eugenics Movement, and he showed archival pictures of the contests. As I, when I was in that, I was in the audience at that talk, and one name kept popping into my head, Carl Emil Seashore. And his dates, just to give you a sense of what I'm talking, you know, what period I'm talking about, he was born in 1866 and he died in 1949, uh, four years after the end of the Second World War. I had first heard about Seashore and his contributions to music when I was a doctoral student, but I had never heard one word that would link him to eugenics. So after the talk, I consulted a host of standard sources in music and music education and found nothing suggesting such links. Now this was a long time ago. I've been working on this book embarrassingly for almost 15 years. Um, remember I was chair of the area for a while that took away from my research agenda. Uh, and w after I had exhausted what I considered to be the conventional academic routes, I tried what at the time was an unconventional one. I googled seashore. I googled seashore and eugenics and I got one hit. It came from the image archives that Selden had helped found. And here it is. It was a letter from the American Eugenics Society. Oh, and by the way, in case you were wondering, this is, these are the winners of the Better Baby and Fitter Family Contest. As you can see, they have, they have ribbons and medals. Actually, someone showed me one of the medals that families got. It was kind of like an Olympic medal. Um, this, is, this, is, this was the hit on the eugenics archives. Uh, it was a letter from the American Eugenics Society asking for tent space at a fair. And there up in the, see all those names up in the letterhead? Uh, was Seashore's name. He, and he was listed there as a member of the American Eugenics Society's Advisory Council. 
Uh, someone mentioned this afternoon Edward Thorndike, the psychologist. He's up there too. I didn't know what it pre precisely meant that Seashore was up there, but I knew I had a story. Forgive me for those who went to the talk this afternoon. I'm going to just give you a little Cliff's Note uh, version of what, <clears throat> what is eugenics. <clears throat> eugenics means well born. Francis Galton. Uh, who's, uh, uh, who was the father of the modern statistics movement and the father of eugenics coined this usage of the term. And among eugenics' fundamental premises is that society should be identifying and promoting those whom they consider biologically fittest and eliminating the rest, the unfit. Today, eugenics typically is associated with Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany. But in reality, these ideas were proliferating in many places throughout the world long before World War II. Nazis were getting many of their ideas from US intellectuals, people like Seashore. And um, Nazi activities were being praised in US eugenics journals long before the outbreak of the Second World War. Um, so this, what you're looking at here, is the logo of the American Eugenics Society. It was a tree. Um, and it says, uh, eugenics comes, it's really, this is very blurry, I'm sorry, but it says, um, the eugenics comes from many roots. And each one of those roots is a different field, like psychology, religion, and so forth. So each root has a label. And um, the, um, <clears throat> the logo on the, on, the, on the logo was, uh, eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. Okay, so Carl Seashore, who was he and why was he an important name in music and music education? He was an experimental psychologist, a pioneer in the field of music psychology, and a professor and later, later a dean of the graduate school at the University of Iowa where I did my master's degree, by the way. Uh, he was a president of the American Psychological Association, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and a member of the National Research Council. He was a hero and famous um, in a host of fields, including psychology, but also audiology, um, uh, ethnomusicology, a lot of fields. He, and outside of music, he, uh, he was in on the ground level in the creation of the Army Alpha Tests, um, which were used um, by the Army in World War I to determine who was fittest uh, to serve in the Army. I believe I, they were used uh, also at Ar Ellis Island, although don't quote me on that, to determine which immigrants were fittest to be admitted into the country. But he, he, was, he was instrumental. He was in on the ground level when the Army Alpha Tests were, uh, were created, which morphed after World War I into another test you may be familiar with, the Scholastic Aptitude Tests, the SATs. Um, he helped make Iowa a hotbed of standardized testing. Out of Iowa City comes ACT, American College Testing, the National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Tests, the Iowa Tests of Basic Skills, which were some of those early standardized tests for elementary students. I took them when I was a child. Um, and the fact, um, uh, it, it's not accidental that these tests were coming out of Iowa because although Seashore did not create these tests, he set the stage and brought in faculty who continued his testing legacy. There's a building named after him at the University of Iowa, which is in the process of being torn down. And there is a psychology clinic uh, on that campus that bears his name to this day. He was an especially big deal in music and music education. He followed in the tradition of Francis Galton in the sense that he believed that musical talent is biologically heritable. Furthermore, he was a Mendelian hereditarian, Mendel, Punnett squares, biology, purple peas, white peas, cross peas. You remember that from high school biology. That's Mendel, Mendelian uh, uh, hereditarian, who believed that musical talent is differentially bestowed in populations um, and immutable and measurable. Measurable using a standardized test that he invented. Yeah. Uh, now, and they came to be known as the seashore tests. First, there were five subtests, and then later on, six um, that were recorded and sold. A uh, hundred years ago, records and recording technology were the hot new technology of the day. And as I said, the recordings came, the first ones came out in 1919. First standardized tests of musical talent, of what seashore called musical capacities. 
The tests were used by the Eastman School of Music in the early part of the 20th century as a criterion for determining who or wh who would not be admitted to the school. That was under the, t under the guidance of Seashore student Hazel Stanton. They were used by K-12 music teachers to determine how much music education mus uh, individuals would receive, which instruments to play, who would, who would qualify to be in the program, and who would not. Um, uh, they were used in basic research as well. Uh, they were flimsy tests, and the validity and reliability of those tests have been called in, were called into, the question, into question early on, although I found out this afternoon that there are some school districts in New York that are continuing to use the seashore tests, which surprised me very much. Um, nevertheless, um, even though they, you know, when, when, his sea, sea, when the seashore tests were, uh, uh, people began questioning the, their, their uh, validity and reliability, um, rather than just say maybe the idea of standardized testing of musical talent isn't such a good idea, uh, they said uh, the problem is not with standardized testing, it's with these particular tests, we need to develop better ones. Um, he was inducted into the Music Education Hall of Fame. For a period, there was an endowed professorship in music education at Temple University named after him, and it was held by his protege, the late Edwin Gordon. You may know the name Gordon. Uh, Gordon was not himself a eugenicist, but uh, he followed, and he followed in Seashore's footsteps, perhaps without realizing how eugenics shaped those footsteps. Um, and some of, uh, some of Gordon's works includes the development of subse a subsequent generation of standardized tests. Okay, so in what way did he set this, the, uh, the course of music education research for the 20th century? Uh, for, after Seashore, uh, music education research often entailed either psychometrics, in other words, developing better tests, or studies of auditory perception. So the idea that, um, that was based on the idea that acute auditory perception is a, ne a necessary component of musical talent. Now, <clears throat> there we go, so that's Seashore. This is the title of my book, Destined, Carl Seashore's World of Music Education and Eugenics. My research has found that Seashore was deeply involved in the American eugenics movement. He wasn't just a casual, oh, I pay my dues member. Uh, not merely, um, uh, and he was on the, the advisory council, which was uh, consisted of an elite few, and um, and that uh, because I've read his work, his 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 uh, views were consistent with the hardliners. He also was a eugenicist to his death, even though other U.S. intellectuals distanced themselves from the movement in the wake of World War II and the Nazi atrocities. My book documents how, how his beliefs about music and music education were fully informed by and consistent with eugenics, as were his ideas about women, his plans for education reform, everything. The fact that his involvement has been ignored, perhaps deliberately buried by most other researchers, um, is also a part of this story. And it's a big and complicated story, and I hope when, when the book comes out that you'll take a look at it. So, the title of the book came from a quote from Seashore himself. Um, he, in, in, Those who are destined to fail should be eliminated early. He was talking about, actually, education tracking. He believed that if you have biology, like biology one, you shouldn't just have one section of biology, but you should have ability, um, hierarch a, a, a hierarchical set of sections of ability of the biology class, and that you would use standardized testing to slot people into one of those sections. And then he said, this is a really good idea because those who are destined to fail should be eliminated early. So he wasn't talking about physical death, as the Nazis were, yet promoting the fittest, eliminating the unfit, and were themes that were foundational to eugenics. Uh, this is an undated image. I'm, there are a couple of things. I hope you listen for uh, references to New York. I tried to find references to New York State, and also references to suffrage. So you, you may hear that uh, scattered through the talk tonight. This is an image um, of an early graduating class from the College of New Rochelle. And what I want to talk about tonight is what Seashore said about women, education, marriage, and fertility. Uh, the bulk of Seashore's discussion of, of women in education focused on high ed higher education. He was, after all, the, the dean of a graduate school. And he freely gave advice to women students in person 
and then reported on what he told women and in his publications. He supported schooling for girls and women, including higher education, but the level of support depended on the kind of higher education under discussion and the purposes of that education. He believed that at least some women should go to college to earn two or four year degrees. A champion of creating a wide variety of post high school educational opportunities, including junior colleges and training schools, and of revitalizing normal school institutions, which is where teachers were educated at the time. Julia Etta Crane, normal school. He mapped out a hierarchy, hierarchy of higher education institutions categorizing and ranking types of institutions according to their goals and target populations. And by the way, such a ranking system still exists. It's called the Carnegie system, and this is how we come to talk about R1 institutions. If you ever look at that list, what is at the bottom of the, of the list is tribal colleges. So significantly, junior colleges, and I don't think Seashore helped create the Carnegie, um, the Carnegie rating system, but it's a certain mentality that says that you know you, you need to you have these different types of schools and you need to create this sort of hierarchy of institutions. Significantly, junior colleges, normal schools, and training schools, the institutions on the lowest rung of Seashore's higher education institutional ladder, were the options he considered especially well suited for women. And I'm I'm quoting, and I'm using his terminology quote, Negroes from the South. If you're interested in why, uh, that actually, that, that reference uh, has a link to eugenics and we can talk about it during the discussion if you're interested, so just be sure to, to ask. His support for women undertaking any form of post high school study was qualified by his understandings of the purposes of educating to women. To him, a woman's ultimate career goals ought to be marriage and motherhood with all education plans developed and adjusted accordingly. For example, he praised women who possess musical skill, claiming that it makes them more attractive as a wife, as long as music is not pursued as an all-consuming career. And here I quote Seashore. A woman skilled in music is, as a rule, especially admired and sought in marriage. And marriage, as a career in itself, then invites music as an avocation, not as a fierce, all-demanding, time-consuming goal of composition. He also believed that trouble lies ahead when all education roads for women do not lead to the altar. He freely gave advice uh, to students on marriage, women in particular. For example, in a book chapter entitled, Why No Great Women Composers, he asserted that for, and you know, if, you, if you're a historian, you know this was a question that was being uh, tossed around before Seashore's time. He asserted that for women, marriage is a career in itself. His use of the word normal, a word frequently employed by psychologists and eugenicists to describe women who set marriage and family as their ultimate life goals, helped draw the boundaries of acceptable behavior, marking women who did not have these priorities and goals as abnormal and pathological. In the same chapter, he also stated that bearing children will add to, quote, normal development of a woman, and claimed that, quote, although married women may not have produced great compositions, they have produced great composers, end quote. Thus, being a composer's mother, in Seashore's estimation, was every bit as worthwhile as being a composer, more worthwhile if you are a woman. Some of Seashore's most telling remarks on women, education, and marriage appeared in a 1940 book chapter, 1940, 12 years before I was born, entitled The Aesthetics of Marriage, which he co-authored with his wife, Roberta. The bulk of this chapter is for or about women, marriage thus being positioned as a woman's topic, and um, a positioning uh, w that was supported by the fact that Seashore's wife wrote most of the chapter. As Carl stated in the introduction, when he was too busy to write an invited lecture on marriage, he asked his wife whether she would do it, if he would deliver it. He claimed that she knew more about the topic than he did. Even though the bulk of the chapter was written by Roberta, with Carl contributing only the two introductory paragraphs and a two-page conclusion, Carl was listed as first author. Significantly, he stated that he wholeheartedly agreed with everything Roberta had written and added, and I quote, I wish to say that the reaction of students to this lecture has convinced me that professors' wives should do more of the writing of lectures for their husbands who hold the platform, end quote. Notably, wives were to write their prof professorial husbands' lectures, not become, not become professors themselves. 
According to Roberta and Carl, uh, for women, a college education elevated homemaking to an art, a beautiful aesthetic experience. Roberta also discussed women and careers, stating that combining marriage and career may be possible for a few extraordinary women, but that for most women, marriage and ch children should be the only and the noblest career. Too often, she opined, a woman's attempt to combine career and marriage comes at the price of personal happiness and marital harmony. Roberta, remember, 1940. Roberta enumerated the many supposed hazards to a marriage that a, a woman's career creates, arguing that it limits the number of children born, contributes to the neglect of children and husband, and fosters a sense of inferiority in the husband. She stated that if a woman has a career, it should be an avocation so that it does not come before her family. She closed by, by claiming, quote, fine children are a greater satisfaction and asset to the parents and to the state Let's re I'll come back to that. Isn't that interesting? To the parents and to the state, uh, than a hundred mediocre career products forgotten a month, in a, forgotten in a month, and gone with the wind. End quote. Nowhere, not in this article or elsewhere, did issues of conflict between marriage, education, and career appear in Seashore's advice to men. While Seashore generally supported an undergraduate education for some women, he took a dimmer view of women undertaking graduate study. And graduate schools were at the top of Seashore's hierarchical ladder of institutions of higher education. He also assumed that most or all students holding graduate degrees are and should be men. In an open letter addressed to women in graduate schools, which he published in 1942, late in his life, Seashore offered a measure of support for women attending graduate school. For example, he opened with an optimistic progress trope, praise for the increase during his lifetime in the number of women graduate students and the claim that nearly every profession is now open to women. Despite these sunny remarks, however, the article is filled with warnings and caveats and is not uh, supportive of women graduate students overall. For example, he claimed that women graduate students should be asking, what shall be my attitude toward marriage? Is there danger of becoming a neurotic old maid? I'm, the, I'm quoting here. What is the effect of intense study on physical health? Does graduate training make a woman mannish? End quote. He placed women graduate students in one of three categories based on their reasons for undertaking graduate study, and he bestowed or withheld uh, uh, approval accordingly. In the first group, he placed women who have a clear and practical professional, semi-professional, or technical job in mind. In other words, if you're going to go become a teacher, that's good, and he approved of those women and their goals. The second group consisted of women who seek marriage to a man in a learned career and who are pursuing graduate study in order to find and keep a pace of such a husband to be a fit help meet for him, and Seashore approved of these women and their goals. He did not similarly praise women in the third category, and I quote, distinctly career-minded women, end quote, who seek a learned career, quote, whether married or not. Seashore noted, I quote, it is these women who confront the most serious problems of orientation and need the most helpful guidance. In the, aesthetic of, in the aesthetics of marriage, Cesar similarly, de, similarly described the career woman as the biggest problem he faced as a dean. One of his many anecdotes, published anecdotes, described uh, a woman doctoral student who approached him to talk about her career after completing her degree. He advised her not to think about that, stating he figured she would be getting married anyway soon. She went away angry. As proof of the accuracy of his hunch and the wisdom of his advice, he reported that she married within six weeks of commencement and six years later had shown no interest in a career or her chosen field. He said that her doctoral study was, and I quote, a superior preparation for the life she is now leading in her place in society. Presumably that was of wife and mother. One of Seashore's concerns was that too many women graduate students fail to cultivate their social natures which he claimed to constitute the very charm of an educated woman. That's the title of the talk tonight. He thus advised professional women not to sacrifice the development of her personality as a cultured woman. Stating that graduate work is tailor-made for men, he also warned women graduate students not to be mannish in their attitudes or approach toward it. 
together with references to the improved marriage prospects of attractive educated women, Seashore's comment about the charm of an educated woman indicates that in his estimation, the worth of a woman should be measured in terms of her physical and intellectual allure to men. I also must state that he, he also said, well, we need to be a little bit careful about our, as a graduate uh, school, about our allocation of resources. Is it a waste of money to send um, women to graduate school? And he said, well, no, it isn't, because even if they don't become professors, they'll be, be they'll be better mothers for it. But it's still, it was his, he had really, really dim views um, about, um, he had most, his most reservations were about women graduate students. Thus, graduate school, which stood at the pinnacle of his hierarchy of post-high school educational opportunities, was the place Seashore was least willing to open to women. In effect, he was claiming that the ag academic rigor, exciting opportunities to study abroad, pathways to high status professional careers, and experiences with the ultimate in liberal culture, which he described as the attractions of graduate study, are privileges rightfully belonging by and large to men. I, I do want to point out um, that Seashore assumed that men and women are intellectual equals, and he also believed that women and men had equal musical capacity based on his Seashore tests. So um, in answering the question, why no great women composers, he turned instead to psychoanalytics, uh, to uh, Jung. He uh, alluded to the Jungian notion of the internal feminine in, the psycho in his psychological explanation, arguing that the absence of great women composers is due to fundamentally, quote, different and distinctive male and female urges. Um, Seisher was one of the psychologists who met uh, Sigmund Freud and Jung many years early when um, uh, G. Stanley Hall invited uh, Freud and Jung to speak at Clark University. And it, it was Freud's first um, visit, uh, first visit to the United States and it actually launched a psychoanalytic career. So here's what Seashore had to say. Woman's fundamental urge is to be beautiful, loved, and adored as a person. I'm doing this because, I'm gonna read this to you not because I, I don't think you can read, but because I'm not sure what's being, what's, what's, what um, this is being live streamed, what people who are live streaming, can, uh, watching it by live stream can see. Man's urge is to provide and achieve in a career. There are exceptions, but from these two theories arise the countless forms of differential selection in the choice and pursuit of a goal for life. They make the eternal feminine and the persistent masculine type. It is the goal that accounts for the difference. Men and women both have their choice and both can take pride in their achievements. Okay. Think about the impact of this man. Not just as a dean, but as the author of a number of publications on the subject, and I just shake my head. Talk about a culture of discouragement. Few of Seashore's views about women in education and music were new. He was recycling familiar tropes that just as easily could have come out of a mid-19th century women's magazine, such as Godey's Ladies Book. And in fact, these next slides do come from Godey's Ladies Book. Uh, for example, among those who supported women's education in mid-19th century, the notion that women have equal intellect, but men should, equal intellect to men, but should put it to a, a different purpose, was a standard strand of thought in the second half of the 19th century in the United States. The desirability, oh, I'm sorry, these are dark. The desirability of women, this is a woman at the piano and the child, you know, this is, this is music for domesticity. Uh, cultivating music is an ornamental amateur activity and the need for a modicum of music education that would make um, uh, women more desirable mates and mothers were other standard tropes. The doctrine of separate spheres and the cult of domesticity as manifest in the angel in the household and the queen of the hearth factored heavily into 19th century logic about the importance of education in making women fit wives and mothers. Um, the Seashore's attitudes about women in careers, notably that jobs outside the home are acceptable for middle class ladies. Remember, there, was, there were class differences in who worked outside the home, but only into, until marriage, and that true happiness cannot be found in a career outside the home. Similarly, are throwbacks to popular middle, 19th century middle class views. This is, um, you can't see this very well, but this is a study in the doctrine of the separate spheres. Uh, the boy is, is, um, is on the outdoor, the, the separate spheres translated in into the outdoor world and the home. And he is, he is sitting between his sister, it's called brother and sister, and the outside world, protecting her. You notice he has his gun. And I, I found this in my dissertation research a long time ago. On her side, on the feminine side, in the feminine sphere is a tambourine. Music was constructed as a feminine activity, even though some 
some, some music activities and styles of music were not considered appropriate for women. It's also important to remember that eugenics didn't appear out of nowhere either. It had to pass what I call the sniff test. It had smells sufficiently familiar not to be rejected as crazily outrageous. Okay? Now, previous music education scholars have discussed Seashore's attitudes about women, education, and marriage, and fertility. In one instance, they were defended at, by one of these scholars as typical of their times. Um, and they've been um, critiqued as unabashedly sexist. But what previous scholars have not taken into account is how eugenics, and by extension, racism, informs his views. Knowledge of seashores and this is an optical illusion. Perhaps you're familiar with this. First, you see the, the, the vase, the urn, and then take a look, look a little more closely, and you can see the faces of the two people looking at each other. Uh, knowledge of Seashore's involvement in eugenics places his views on women in education and on a host of other topics as well in a somewhat different light, prompting a different reading. For me, it was like looking in an optical illusion. Um, the images, it was there all along. I just didn't notice it. So central to a rereading of Seashore's comments about women, education, and marriage is an understanding of the eugenical perspective sometimes termed race suicide. Race suicide um, was a term coined in 1901 by a sociologist who later taught at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Edward Ellsworth Ross. He founded the sociology and anthropology department there. And it referred to what was perceived by eugenicists to be a serious threat not only to the future of the nation, but also to the whole human race. The dying out of the ostensibly fit, coupled with the unbridled proliferation of the unfit. Historian Barry Meller states that the concept of race suicide was quickly adopted and popularized by progressives, including President Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, this is a slightly more cynical uh, por portrayal of Roosevelt's race suicide uh, perception, which I found, which is from the perspective of a woman having the babies and doing the work. So Roosevelt says, sow your seed to prevent race suicide. But it, does, it looks like the mother who's, so, who's doing all the work on, in the field with the babies in the basket, like four or five babies in the back, isn't very happy. So it's, 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 it's a little bit of a, it's a, little bit of a, a critical uh, cartoon. Uh, rooted in a fear-hope double gesture, race suicide discourses and the practices that stemmed from it circulated among eugenicists in the United States and flourished abroad as well. The concept appeared, for example, in a chilling address by Nazi Interior Minister Wilhelm Frick, which was published in 1934. Now remember the Second World War, the United States entered in 45. The war, I believe, entered uh, in, 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 uh, uh, but this was published in 1934 in the American journal Eugenical News. Now mind you, this was the journal where Seashore's name appeared in every issue as a member of the advisory council. Eugenics journals also refer to uh, race, racial degeneration, racial decay, or racial decadence, which allegedly was spreading across Europe and the United States like a plague. Eugenicists call, people, gr call groups of people stock, a term derived from am animal husbandry, and the word reflects the eugenics movement's roots in the American Breeders Association. For example, in 1936, Eugenical News published an article by American eugenicist and Nazi sympathizer C.G. Campbell defending Nazi actions in Germany. There, I actually found one quote in, uh, in, an, in a U.S. journal saying, it, it's right that um, the Jews are being driven out, that Jewish physicians are being driven out of, uh, out of Berlin, uh, Jewish physicians, because um, there, are, there, there's a, there is a disproportionate number of them, and it is reigning Jews. So this is from C.G. Campbell. This national policy seeks to attain the greater purity of racial stocks by selective endogamous mating and breeding with a clear conception and convic conviction as to its beneficial effects upon its racial quality and its culture, the increased proportionate reproduction of the more competent eugenic stocks and the proportionate decrease of the incompetent and undesirable dysgenic stocks. The traits that relegated some individuals and groups to the fit category and others to the unfit were considered heritable, immutable, and unequally distributed in populations, exactly what Seashore believed about musical talent. 
Race, social class, nationality, and immigrant status figured heavily in constructions of the categories fit and unfit. Sometimes race referred to the whole human race, but in reality, race suicide was not a supposed decline in numbers of the best people of all races. Rather, it was concerned with the supposed decrease of the best examples of the ostensibly best race, white people. It was a virulently racist concept. And as I said to a group this afternoon, uh, the racial, even though uh, eugenicists believed that there is something called race, their racial categories were all over the place. And like Kant, sometimes they included nationality. So they talked about a Norwegian race. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, these, these were very fluid and slippery, slippery categories. In some cases, religions were considered a separate race. And uh, there was a hierarchy of races based on the assumption that some races are more evolved than others. And on this hierarchy, whites were at the top, and this is the term they used, Negroes were at the bottom. That hierarchy also predated eugenics. Remember, it had, eugenics had to pass the sniff test. A frequently cited cause of race suicide was declining birth rates among the ostensibly fit, the so-called native whites. As to why the birth rate was declining among this group, eugenicists blamed liberal attitudes about gender roles, the education of women, poor choices, moral decay, and widespread use of contraception. Some eugenic sources specifically blamed the graduates of colleges and universities, as well as the institutions that educated them, particularly elite Ivy League and seven sister schools, such as Harvard, Vassar, and Yale. According to a summary of addresses delivered at the Eugenics Record Research Association's ninth meeting in 1921, the education system was destroying the very beliefs and values needed for the survival and flourishing of the human race. In a discussion of birth rates among various groups in the United States, Paul Popineau, who was an early marriage therapist, and Roswell Johnson, both of whom were staunch eugenicists, stated that even though overall the birth rate of native whites of native parentage was increasing, the birth rate was decreasing in a specific ostensibly superior subgroup, college-educated women. The best educated young women and to a less extent young men of the United States who are for many reasons, who for many reasons may be considered superior, are in many cases avoiding marriage altogether and in other cases postponing it longer than is desirable. The women in the separate colleges of the East have the worst record in this respect, but that of the women graduates of some of the coeducational schools leaves much to be desired. Across the sea from Nazi Germany. After praising the National Socialistic Movement under, under the leadership of Adolf Hitler, in his address published in Eugenical News in the United States in 1934, Nazi Interior Minister Wilhelm Frick blamed declining birth rates in Germany on the moral decay of the people. He further claimed that overuse of contraceptive, contraceptives by the fittest was contributing to birth rate reduction in that group, and he argued that this overuse was the primary cause of national suicide in Germany. So who were the unfit, and how were they contributing to race suicide? One contribution of the un, uh, ostensibly unfit uh, was profligate fertility. Pope Noah and Johnson provided a typical definition of which groups were considered unfit, unfit and too fecund. And by the way, um, my project assistant found this post, a copy of this postcard in her family papers. If you look carefully, you remember, uh, you see the stork is bringing two babies of color. And, it, and um, the caption, which you may not be able to read, says, no race suicide here. Um, so who, <clears throat> well, who were the groups that were uh, unfit and too fecund? The insane, epileptics, quote, physical, mental, and moral cripples, end quote, the feeble-minded, inefficients, wastrels, criminals, Negroes, and non-Nordic immigrants, to name a few. Popeno and Johnson considered poor people, immigrants in particular, to be problematically pro prolific. And um, from that, I mean, they were, um, uh, Francis Galton was riffing off of Thomas Malthus. So if you know something about what Thomas Malthus was saying about the unfit poor in England uh, earlier. All right. And Popeno and Johnson also said that fecundity is inversely related to intelligence. And then maybe we'll just skip over this, um, but this is, this is what he, he was very worried about Pittsburgh. He said, you know, um, 
uh, all cities breed from the bottom. Uh, the lower a class is in the scale of intelligence, the greater is its reproductive contribution. Recalling that intelligence is inherited, inherited that like begets like, in this respect, one can hardly feel encouraged over the quality of the population of Pittsburgh in a few generations hence. And then it talked about, and what's happening to all those fit people who are not having babies. Eugenicists sometimes argued that welfare programs to assist the poor subvert natural selection and enable unfits to produce even more of their own kind. I quote, the inefficients, the wastrels, the physical, mental, and moral cripples are carefully preserved at public expense. The criminal is turned out on parole after a few years to become the father of the family. It was not simply a particular nation that was at risk, they claimed, it was the future of the human race. Race discourses that long predated the American eugenics, eugenics movement associated persons of color, who often were the objects of eugenic intervention, with hypersexuality, fecundity, and uh, early sexual maturity. Just want to point out that um, <laughs> there was suspicion of Catholics as well. I, the alligator heads are bishops' miters. I don't know if you can see that. And so if you look at the alligators on the side, these are bishops coming to the shores, a threat. Uh, immigration, uh, discrimina discrimination against Catholic immigrants uh, long predated the early 20th century, and the perception that they would proliferate due to the Catholic Church's opposition to birth control doubtless played a role in uh, eugenicists relegating them to the abject and profligate unfit category. And as a whole, Catholics opposed eugenics. <clears throat> eugenicists, eugenicists frequently identified the absence of laws regulating immigration as contributing to race su suicide. All right. So just as eugenicists believed that the nature of degeneration, uh, thought about the nature of degeneration uh, dichotomously, they approached proposed solutions dichotomously. One set of solutions called positive eugenics and the other called negative. Positive eugenics was designed to promote the fit and a negative eugenics to eliminate the unfit through a host of strategies. The positive eugenics goal of increasing fecundity of the ostensibly fittest was to be reached in part by education, specifically by spreading the word of the need for and value of the fittest reproducing at higher rates. The American Eugenics Society, Seashore, sure remember, was an early and highly respected member, was formed in order to spread the word of eugenics outside the eugenics research community. E. A. Ross, the, um, among others, argued that the requisite number of children for the fittest families was four. And although it may have been a coincidence, the seashores had four children. Eugenicists often framed their appeals to reproduce in terms of moral responsibility or duties, saying that it was morally reprehensible for the fittest to limit family size. Also, because they considered so many characteristics to be heritable, many eugenicists viewed, viewed individual mate choice and decisions about whether to have children as critical to achieving positive eugenics goals, to breeding the best. Thus, eugenicists supported what they called selective mating, as well as concerted efforts to spread the word about wise mate choice and what they called race hygiene. Here we see the beginnings of sex education in US public schools. Competitions and bonuses to identify and reward the fittest families and individuals, including better baby and fitter family contests, were among the incentives programs eugenicists promoted. Furthermore, individual institutions and legislators were encouraged to promote fecundity through financial incentives, incentives including family allowances and tax breaks. The Nazis were using baby bonuses to encourage their military pilots to have more babies, and eugenicists in the United States were promoting similar projects for aviators who were assumed to be the fittest. U.S. eugenicist E.A. Ross stated that uni universities should implement such allowances for their faculty members. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, eugenicists' fear of re suicide and their aspirations to avert it shaped hardline views on women in education. For example, uh, uh, John Alfred Moen, who was a Norwegian eugenicist, who uh, opened an article entitled The Masculine Education of Women and Its Dangers, which appeared in 1930 in an American journal, eugenics journal, opened the article by stating his opposition to suffrage 
and uh, in Norway and arguing that education reforms by uh, women leaders were destroying the family. Young women ought to be instructed about the serious responsibility in connection with procreation and its conformity to natural law. And Moen said, a proper education for women will lead her to home and hearth. And education should impress upon women their moral obligation to procreate. He, he called, um, uh, he said women have a, a divine calling to be a protector and savior of the race. So keeping eugenical attitudes about race suicide in mind, let's return to Seashore's statements about women, education, marriage, and fertility. And again, in addition to being undeniably sexist, these also clearly are efforts to promote positive eugenics, and they are rooted in the specter of race suicide and the anxieties that fueled it. So, consistent with the broad educational plan, uh, eugenical plan to educate for a better tomorrow, Seashore aimed to achieve positive eugenical goals by disseminating freely given expert advice. Seashore's advice was targeted at college women, a group that eugenicists identified as inherently superior and yet exhibiting unsatisfactory fertility rates, a, a group supposedly contributing to race suicide. So threadbare 19th century tropes derived from the cult of domesticity and separate spheres discourse were repurposed by Seashore, Moen, and others, given new life as they were tied to the future of the nation, the white race, and all of humanity. Um, the assertion prevalent in the 19th century that um, in the United States, affluent white women were culture bearers and conservatives of civilization was repurposed and outfitted with a heightened sense of urgency. Um, in the fear-hope dichotomy on which eugenics was grounded, hope for the race rested with affluent white women who cheerfully accepted their position as brooders and breeders. In stating that a fit college woman had a moral responsibility to maintain her health, to stay fit, Seashore echoed other eugenicists, claiming that preventing race suicide was a moral duty to be taken seriously by the fittest. Thus, in almost every respect, Seashore's statements closely resembled those made by hardline eugenicists such as Moen. The best kind of education for the best women didn't simply point them in the direction of domesticity, it also schooled them in race hygiene, which was to be brought about through wise mate choice. And significantly, Seashore overtly promoted accomplishing race hygiene versus education into wise mate choice. Advising college women to breed and brood often and carefully was only one of Seashore's fertility-related positive eugenics activities, for example. Uh, it, it, uh, eugenics activities. For example, like uh, E.A. Ross and other high, hardline eugenicists, he uh, promoted financial incentives that would encourage the ostensibly fittest to reproduce. And he was talking about professors. And sometimes I would sit in faculty meetings and think about that and see what was going on and think, oh my goodness, if you think this is the best of the human race. And, um, <laughs> Um, so he, he, he wanted, he, he, wa he talked about financial incentives for professors. He said, yes, we need these. He also uh, instituted a program where graduate students in certain fields would get baby bonuses if they had babies while they were in graduate school. Um, now, negative eugenics was concerned with the reduction. I'm almost finished here. I feel like I'm talking your head off. Negative eugenics was concerned with the reduction in the number or the total elimination of the ostensibly unfit. Eugenicist Madison Grant called for the elimination of the least desirable 10% of the community, describing them as the unemployed and unemployable human residuum. Now there were three kinds of fitness or unfitness according to eugenicists, mental, uh, physical, and moral. And the assumption that moral fitness was heritable, moral behavior demonstrated in eight uh, uh, moral fitness or unfitness played a critical role in negative eugenics initiatives directed at women. Moral defect manifests itself in criminal behavior, chronic dependency, and disregard for moral norms, specifically sexual norms, particularly when that disregard was exhibited by women. 
In the United States, standard eugenics, uh, negative eugenics policies promoted contraceptive use by the unfit, voluntary or involuntary sterilization, segregated institutionalization of people with di disabilities to prevent reproduction, immigration restriction, marriage restriction, and reduced welfare funding. Now, negative and positive eugenics goals were to be achieved through voluntary compliance and education. In the case of the unfit, however, eugenicists also em emphasized legislation and externally imposed involuntary actions. Um, the unfit typically were deemed incapable of acting responsibly on their own. Whereas fit women were being urged to reproduce, ostensibly unfit women were being forcibly denied the right to do so. In her book, Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty, Dorothy Roberts states that eugenics was a source of the idea that African American women's fertility and fecundity should be externally regulated and curbed. She notes that this idea persists to the present. I recently saw another statistic about involuntary ster sterilization, and I'm going to quote, between 1929, note the date that's right in the middle of the eugenics movement, and 1974 in North Carolina, 7,000 people were involuntarily sterilized. 85% of those sterilized were women and girls, while 40% were minorities, most of whom were black, end quote. Similarly, in her article, Policing the Wayward Woman, Eugenics in Wisconsin's Involuntary Sterilization Program. Phyllis Resky states that in Wisconsin, as was the case in the United States as a whole, the majority of people involuntarily sterilized were women, generally poor or working class women. Immoral behavior, according to Resky, could include having multiple sex partners, giving birth out of wedlock, engaging in sodomy, for white women having sex with Indians, Italians, or Negroes having sexual intercourse readily, cunningly, and frequently, or even running after men. Thus, many women were involuntarily sterilized on the ground that they were promiscuous. Finally, outright physical annihilation was a, was a possible negative eugenics measure, and although outright killing was not discussed by most US sources I examined, other forms of elimination figured prominently in eugenics in, uh, uh, discourse in the early 20th century. Those who are destined to fail should be eliminated early. That was Seashore's education policy. Um, documenting Seashore's views on negative eugenics policies and practices was more difficult largely because I found few explicit statements. But the eugenics planks I have just described dominated eugenical discourse both in the United States and elsewhere, and discussions of negative eugenics pervaded the American Eugenics Society, the Eugenics Researchers Associations, the journals these organizations published, the books they promoted, and the conferences they sponsored. These organizations were vigorous and relentless in their support of both positive and negative measures, and Seashore belonged to these organizations, and he was a charter member of the American Eugenics Society. Given the pervasiveness of support for negative eugenics in the organizations to which he belonged, it would have been impossible for him to be aware of these policies and practices. Um, as historian Barry Meller states, the very purpose of the American Eugenics Society was to achieve political and educational rather than research goals, and those goals focus, focused on the prevention of race suicide. The American Eugenics Society's membership letter went one step further. Race suicide was explicitly descri described as the destruction of the white race. Seashore's name also appeared, um, in addition to every, on every issue of these eugenics journals, on what's been considered the catechism of American eugenics. It's, uh, it's called Tomorrow's Children by uh, uh, Tomorrow's Children, and, and uh, what were the planks, catechisms, when in my childhood, we, you, if you were learning, uh, if you were being schooled in religion, you, you studied the catechism, and there were a series of questions, like what is to be, you know, a, a religious question, and then there would be an answer. So this is, the Ellsworth Huntington's Tomorrow's Children was set up in a similar way. And, um, and in it, um, here is the catechism of eugenics supported sterilization, segregation, and immigration restric restriction. Now, Seashore spoke elsewhere about the need for legal restriction to 
prevent degeneracy. But he didn't specify which legal restrictions he had in mind, and yet, given the context, it's, uh, it, I would assume that the, the, that, that litany that you find in tomorrow's children is, are the legal restrictions he was talking about. Significantly, Seashore did not write letters of concern to the editors of Eugenics Journal, nor did he withdraw his membership. He remained a supporter to his death. His silence, I have concluded, was complicity. <clears throat> now, he waxed at length about the fittest women, but Seashore didn't say much about the rest. Women who were not finishing or even attending high school, let alone college or graduate school, women who were not white, women not from the upper class, women who, who refused to be contained. These women are ghosts, invisible in Seashore's writing, but they are absent presences nevertheless. For many of them, the effects of negative eugenics were devastating, constituting a host of ghostly presences. Seashore did make a few disparaging and potentially anxiety-ridden remarks about emancipated women and flappers. Uh, these statements may or may not provide, let's, let's see, I can, let me, what do we got here? Here we go, some flappers. These statements may or, not pro may or may not provide glimpses of his views on abject women and their characteristics. He stated, for example, that colleges must make room for flappers and loafers, but warned that these type of people must not be allowed to contaminate good students. Those were his words. According to the Oxford Dictionary, a flapper tended to dress or act like men and to want to vote. Seashore likened flappers to tramps a word that to the present carries with it negative connotations linking a woman's morality to her sexual practices. As Wendy Klein notes, in the eyes of eugenicists, the woman adrift represented a dysgenic threat. So by speaking disparagingly of flappers and other emancipated women, was Seashore signaling that they were constitutionally inherent and inherently unfit? Maybe on, on the one hand he did. Um, uh, he deemed them so, not on intellectual grounds, but on moral ones, d destined to fail due to inherent moral defect. On the other hand, perhaps in his estimation, flappers and emancipated women were more akin to wayward women who were foolishly aspiring to graduate study. Perhaps rather than being constitutionally unfit, college women who did not place marriage and family first were, in Seashore's mind, misguided and in need of wise counsel, like flappers uh, and emancipated women, fit sheep who had gone astray, but sheep that could be redeemed through education, women who needed to be made aware of the dire consequences if they foolishly squandered their birthright. Flappers and emancipated women, regardless of whether they were constitutionally unfit, were uncontained women, however, and Seashore was critical of them. Behaving in a manner that resembled the hereditarily unfit was a sign that a fit woman had gone astray. Significantly, emancipated women and flappers may have held the same views and engaged in many of the same activities that Reski claims were grounds for the involuntary sterilization of women deemed inherently morally, immorally unfit. I found no evidence, however, that despite his criticism, Seashore supported using eugenics, negative eugenics me me measures on flappers and emancipated women any more than he was suggesting that problematic women graduate students should be sub uh, sterilized or subjected to marriage restrictions. Rather, their race and social class were protecting these women. Perhaps he would have offered flappers the same advice that he gave to women graduate students. Come to your senses, go home, get married, and start having babies. This was not the advice eugenicists were given to those labeled constitutionally unfit, however. Not only should women deemed unfit, whether because of race, economic status, morals, or intelligence, not be staying home with their children, they should not be having children at all. Thus, acknowledging that Seashore was a member, um, uh, so, so acknowledging that Seashore, who was a member of the Music Education Hall of Fame, was a, a, an avowed eugenicist, and bringing eugenics into an analysis of his statements about women makes visible connections and intersections that might otherwise remain hi hidden, specifically how these views were grounded in and integrally related to the white supremacist discourse on race that was foundational to eugenics. 
Seashore did not mention race in the references to women that I examined, but it was always hovering in the wings, an absence and absent and yet powerful presence. Just beneath the surface lay racinated anxieties. Other eugenicists robustly expressed white supremacist views and conveyed high levels of white anxiety, however, in journals and books sponsored by the organizations to which Seashore belonged and in eugenics publications where Seashore's work also appeared. Seashore's beliefs nested him close to the hardliners and consequently to the racist fears on which eugenics was grounded. Why were white college-educated women wanted at home? For eugenicists such as Seashore, one reason was to maintain the birth rate of so-called superiors, presumably all of whom were white. Without this, eugenicists warned, superiors would be washed away by degenerates and inferiors. Viewed in this light, Seashore's call for faculty family allowances, allowances was not mere advocacy of family-friendly policies in academe. It was a xenophobic, classed, and racialized response to a call to arms. The alleged peril was the potential annihilation of the supposedly superior forms of the human race. Were Seashore's statements aimed at preserving the patriarchy, or maintaining class distinctions, or upholding the racial contract? The answer is yes on all counts. All of this is part of music education's legacy, and we have a responsibility to acknowledge it and to take responsibility for it. Later this week, I will be giving other lectures and other pieces of this complex picture. For example, I will be talking about direct connections that I have found, funding connections, discursive and rhetorical connections, and research citation connections between eugenics as practiced 100 years ago, contemporary eugenicists, um, the Trump administration, and Trump's white supremacist supporters. So inv I invite you to come back and stay tuned, and I thank you. Thank you. I was going to say, no, I could see nothing. I was looking into a sea of, of, of nothingness. I could not see. I couldn't see facial expressions. So it was just like, so I, I'm happy to see your faces. I'd be happy to uh, field questions if people have some. Um, yes. What was his position on evolution? A really good question. Ah, yes. He, um, um, I, earlier today, um, he, he believed in, in, this, the, in the, the notion of the evolution, the human evolution, and then the evo di uh, differential evolution of different races. And that was foundational to his idea that some races were more evolved than others. So not only were people more involved, but evolved, but also cultural artifacts were more evolved, so there were uh, more evolved. So there was, um, there was uh, high art music, and there was primitive music. That was those, those kinds of, that kind of terminology, which he used freely, uh, was part of his, of his belief in this evolution of races and the cultural products associated with them. So yeah, he was right there. And um, I think that Galton uh, was a relative of, Charles Darwin, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong on that. Don't quote me on that. But they were, they were all kind of hanging out together. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Um, what was the source position you know, about um, using education to maybe uplift the people you saw as a like people of color or like Italians, you said Catholics, um, like post secondary school education? Yeah. Um, to the degree that they could be uplifted. Do you want me to speak into the microphone? Uh, about the use of education for uplift, to the degree that they could be uh, to, that they could be uplifted. So it was sort of the seed in soil. We talked about this uh, this afternoon concerning musical talent. Yes, you want this rich environment. So, but you have to have the seed there first. If you don't have that whatever that innate potential there, then you're wasting your time and your money. And this was the time of social of, of social efficiency when they were talking about education in terms of of efficiency. And efficiency meant you do things with less money and less time. So efficient was defined in very in fairly narrow terms. 
Good question. Other questions? I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing. Somebody's pointing up here. Raise your hand up really high. Oh, there's, okay, I see somebody back there. Uh, excuse me for pointing, but I, yes, go ahead. Uh, what was in the seashore's childhood and background that led him to develop some of these ideas about race and women and um, end up having him join the American Eugenics Society? That's a really good question. I, and one of the reasons that I, um, I had the hunch that he might be involved in eugenics was that he was born, born up and raised on a farm. And um, that uh, uh, the American Breeders Association started out, I mean, in the American Eugenics Society, if you look at the early journals, they were talking about breeding rabbits in one article and they were talking about breeding humans in another. So I think that agrarian culture and the long history in the United States of the use of statistics in, I mean, if you go back to George Washington's time, they were using statistics to talk about crop yields even before, I mean, at the time when this nation became a nation. So, it, you know, that, that, that made a certain kind of sense. And also, you know, I, I think that, you know, it's just for, for all of us, um, the systems of reasoning to which we've been exposed um, shape, you know, what we can or cannot see the way we imagine the world. So I think a profound impact. Um, I mean, there are many similarities between him and me. Um, not only the connection to the University of Iowa, but he went to Gustavus Co Adolphus College, which was a small Lutheran college in St. Peter, Minnesota, and I attended St. Olaf, which is another small Lutheran college just down the road. Um, so I see many resemblances, so it's not like this was a, a bygone era and these ideas um, have gone away. I think they're still... I, I had a wonderful conversation this afternoon uh, with, uh, with some of the graduate students about some of these dilemmas about um, balancing work uh, and family, and I think some of these ideas are, are still very much out there. Um, so, yeah, I think we are what we eat, right? You be on a very organic level. You, on a very cellular le level, we do become what we eat, and so you become something else um, by gradually, in a sort of very gradual process, by very gradually eating something else. Good question. Other questions? I have lulled you into soporific. Yes? Except in the public schools, like I see remnants of this, like for example, somebody auditioning a fifth grader for a chorus and then the kid sings their best, and you're not good enough to be in this chorus. Get out, you're not good enough for me to teach. And this happens every day. This book is huge. It's 700 pages long. And some of the chapters talk about the, um, he, he was advocating education reform at the higher education level and at the K-12 level. And one of the reasons in the last chapter, which is called resemblances, is that I say, I see resemblances everywhere. And why is it I see resemblances? And one of the reasons is these education reform ideas of the early 20th century could become standard practice. But people don't see them as being associated with the eugenics movement. So the, a strong emphasis on competition, and Seashore waxed at length about the value of competition, especially competition among the fittest, to keep your, you know, to keep your, your knife sharp by, by competition. Gifted and talented programs. Uh, if you um, go to websites that advocate gifted and talented programs today, you will see almost verbatim quotes that could have come from people like Seashore. He was, he was intellectual in the creation of, I mean, he, he went around the whole country advocating gifted and talented programs, special advantages for the most gifted students. And if you go to websites today, they will say the same things like, the truly disadvantaged child in our schools today, the child who's being most retarded is the gifted child. They come straight out of the genetics. So you're right, you see uh, auditions, uh, you see uh, um, uh, you know, uh, gifted and talented programs to be labeled as IB programs or AP programs, but the notion, he really said, you should not be, you should not have integrated in your classrooms because um, you're just, you're wasting your time with this. You're, they're being held back and dragged out by the unfit. Now there's a whole lot of research that suggests, and of course I think about gifted and talented programs and what people don't learn in gifted and talented how to get around along with the rest of the world. Or there are, you know, what, what might be wrong with gifted and talented programs? Um, but in his mind, you really you needed to keep, you needed to keep the, 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 the gift going as fast as they possibly could and segregate it from everybody else as much as possible. Yes? How long after his initial tests of musical potential 
were published, did it take for them to be criticized as flimsy and inconsistent? Was it immediate or did it take a couple of years? Or Good question. There, there were fights. I mean, I don't know if there are fights in music education anymore like there used to be, but there, the, 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 Mer the, the James Mercer Seashore fights were, were right from the beginning. Um, Mercer was all over him in saying um, that uh, Seashore's notion of musical uh, talent was too atomistic, it was too limited. So right from the beginning, but um, I found sources that, I mean, as I said, I think I said, I, if, if, if I'm getting a little bit incoherent right now, it's because I spent the night last night at, on the floor at a pair um, on, uh, on a cot, and so I didn't get much sleep. But, um, uh, uh, so where am I going with this? Oh yeah, that, that somebody said today that there are school districts in New York that are still using the secret tests. And if they're not using the seashore test, they're using subsequent generations. So what my predecessor at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison was Peter Dykema. And uh, the Dykema tests were another, were, were part of that second generation of tests. And of course, then Edward Gordon, Ed Gordon's uh, musical after, uh, achievement profile, aptitude profile, I can't remember what it was called. That's, that's also part of that tradition. So <coughs> yeah, they were criticized right from the beginning. Um, there's, uh, Seashore tells the story of, of, of going to meet with me, and he, he was an active promoter. He'd go to the national conventions, like what we would call the NACME convention, conventions, and he, in 1919, he demonstrated his test. And um, they brought in groups of kids, think about this, who were administered the test on the spot. And um, there was, uh, I'm doing this from the top of my, my head, uh, but there was one child who was found to, you know, like in the first percentile or something, and I'm thinking, can you imagine having that revealed? Did they talk about this to the whole group uh, that this one child was in the first percentile? But apparently they also gave the test to the teachers. And, um, and one teacher stood up and said, I'm a very successful music educator, and I still poorly on this test. And, and Seashore uh, ridiculed him and said, um, well, are you a good composer? And he said, no, I'm a music teacher. He said, well, are you a great composer? Performer and he said, No, he said, Are you great with that? And he said, No. And he said, Well, this just proves my test is right. You're a businessman, you're not a musician. So that's how he handled, he, he, you know, he, he, he ridiculed, he openly ridiculed and dismissed. So, and, and I don't know if I answered your question. No, you yeah, no, came on. There was criticism from the beginning, but they, they held up for a long time. Yeah. Do you feel that Seashore's kind of hidden underweight eugenics and all these ideas that were kind of glanced over or kind of covered up in the years um, leading up to like this type of research was a result of like what we talked about earlier with the dehumanization, where you kind of did it to himself the role of being the guidance or being the guide. Like, in terms of like when we talk about guiding women and guiding students as being this very negative, um, protective being, it almost dehumanized him through like proxy, right. where you kind of go, oh, he's just guiding people, he's just hiding these ideas. I believe there was a deliberate effort to talk about um, I mean, he died in 1949, which was um, four years after the end of the Second World War. And I looked at all of his obituaries. I looked at, er, at things that were written about him, and it was not the right word. His uh, biography was written by Walter Hiles, one of his students. And in the back are references to some of his eugenics publications, which means that Miles knew and chose not to write about him. So I think it was, it was just, you don't speak ill of the dead in you know, an obituary, you know, and this was a time when this was just not something that people who, his, his acolytes, um, wanted to, um, wanted to make life Do
I feel like I'm, okay. So, I mean, I think you're asking this question, so what, what, what can we do with this and how can we still feel good about ourselves and do we have any su suggestions? Um, and before I do that, I, I wanna go back to your question and then I'll get this, because this is still hanging around in my brain a little bit. I think one of the things that made Seashore's message so very powerful is how positive he was. He was optimistic, he was cheerful, he was not Paul Popino who was saying we should uh, execute them all. I mean, there were, there were a few Americans who were in that, but he, it was sort of like, the, you know, the sunny side of the, the Second World War. He was, he was very positive and optimistic, and I think that's part of the, the danger of it, is that it's, it's, if you think about Foucault and power, you know, Foucault says that you get things done not just by fear and threat, but also by desire and by the positivity. So just to, to, to answer that. And then, you know, what can we do with this? Um, later this week, uh, I mean, I think this is a conversation that we should be having nationally and locally in classrooms. Um, Carlos Abril and uh, Ken Elpis came out with a new study just in the last month or so that is a replication of their study of almost 20 years ago talking about who is or is not participating in music and the new statistic, and I will talk about this later this week, is that 76% of all high school students are not participating in any music regardless of race. And um, then there are some racial de demographics that they break out as well. So I think that's a conversation. I, I don't have good answers, but I think we need to, we need to take a look at that can and we need to look at what made us, you know, w w w the bread that that w worked so well for us and is is not working for a, a lot of other students. And I also mentioned um, in 2013 there was a manifesto that came out uh, from the College Music Society. Um, saying that um, uh, music programs uh, need to take a hard look at um, what they are or are not doing. And one of the uh, suggestions was, why is the large ensemble model continuing to drive schools with music? And in what ways is that preventing other things from happening um, in these schools? So that's not a very good answer, but it's, it's a short answer, but it is, it is complicated. Um, and, I, and some of you will be reading my piece, Listening for Whiteness, that talks about um, uh, the audition process and what kinds, what styles of music at my school of music are still considered acceptable as audition pieces and how that systematically excludes uh, people at a time when perhaps we should be thinking of, uh, about more, much more thoughtfully about access and music. So Mark, you had a question as well? Number one, I think is, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is that we need to take responsibility for the race, the race legacy that many white people are just want to pussyfoot around um, and acknowledge how deeply political um, music and education are and always have been. That's two. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Maybe the third has to do with your question, Andrea, about about where do we, where might we turn? Um, when we revised, we 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 tried to do a radical revision of our um, of our undergraduate program at UW Madison, uh, and we uh, we did the best we could with the music ed program, but there was a lot of resistance from the performers and the conductors. Um, they they had a lot invested in the status quo, and I think they were quite frightened about the, you know, this was like, I do opera. <laughs> this is not what we do here. Um, but, you know, I think about how, even within the music ed classes, that we're trying to open the epistemological minds. So um, there are different ways of thinking about music in the world. 
that have, where there are cultures where the notion of musical ability has no salience, where it's just something everybody does. Um, there are different ways of thinking, epistemological assumptions about what it means to be a knowing musician. So back at Madison, I taught a class called Teaching Vocal Styles. I designed it, and it was kind of designed to blow people the lid off of people's uh, heads about uh, what make, doing things with your voices might mean. And one of the people we, I brought in was a throat singer. And um, this throat singer actually used to be an EMT in San Francisco. And then he became a shepherd. And he believes that throat singing is a way that you, that you connect with other people, that the singer connects with other worlds. And so he said, he tells, he told the class that when he was in an EM, when he was an EMT in San Francisco, he ushered people in and out of the world, that he brought babies into the world and he, he, he helped people, he was with people when they died. And he believed that, he believes that as a throat singer, he communicates between these worlds. So with that in mind, that's a very different way of thinking about what it means to be a knowing musician. And even if we look in the, the classical high art tradition, you know, in the, in the 18th and 19th century, you were nothing if you didn't improvise. I mean, um, I think it was Valerie Gertsen who said, the Chopin preludes, you know, when, when Beethoven and others sat down to play one of these pieces, they, it was expected that they would improvise, you know, they, you'd, you'd, you'd improvise for a while before you launched into the piece. Or think about concerti, where you were not supposed to play the, the cadenza that's there, you were supposed to make it up along the way. That musicians who were worth, this is an epistemological assumption, to be a knowing musician is to be able to improvise. So it's not that we don't even have a tradition within the Western, within Western higher art music of saying what it means to be a mo knowing musician has varied over times. But when you bring in a throat singer who says it really has to do with how do you communicate with this other world, with these, how do you get to these thin spaces, that, that's, that's a little bit different from can you read standard notation, right? What it means to be a knowing musician. Does that help? So looking for, to these places and where, where people uh, think differently. Uh, about, and, and also uh, an attitude, I'm gonna talk later this week about hospitality. Um, uh, let us therefore say yes to who or whatever shows up. How often do we say in music education, yes to who or whatever shows up? Yes, one question. Uh, how many of the different vocal styles that you discussed in your classes would be admitted in a conservatory model like Madison or Berkeley or Wisconsin Have you read my piece, Listening for Whiteness? Okay. So I asked someone, because nobody ever talked to me face to face. My appointment, see I get, I, my full appointment is in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction and I have a zero dollar appointment in the School of Music. So I occupy this other space. But so I went over and I, and I, and I, and, and so nobody ever talked to me to my face about that particular piece from the School of Music, but I heard through the back door that people were talking about it quite a bit. And so I did ask someone, I said, you know, and, and, and uh, we've had students audition, for example, there was a classical Indian singer, as in Asian Indian, who had studied with a master singer in Chicago who came and auditioned and was not admitted to the program. And, when, and we have no say, as you, if you read, the, the music ed area had no say in the admissions process, and when we questioned people about why do we do this, and they said, well, this was sort of truth in advertising. This is not what we do here. And of course, in my, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, maybe what you do here is not what our teachers need. Um, if you're going to be in the business of, of music teacher preparation in a diverse world going out, uh, uh, then maybe you need to start thinking about what do music teachers need to... And of course, in that listening for whiteness, um, I wanted to talk about, I wanted to use the phrase, a lover on the side. Because I believe that a lot of musicians, um, sort of classically trained musicians, sort of guiltily and surreptitiously have what I called a lover on the side, which is they do other kinds of music. It's just that they're, it, oftentimes they're not, it's not acknowledged in the studio, or p the studio teacher will say, well, you can do that as long as it doesn't interfere with your real, if it doesn't interfere with the real business, which is your classical training. Um, so, and I think this has been true at other places like Juilliard. I've heard that the, the, 
the, the, there are generations that are more polymusical, it's just not, it's not being recognized. So that's why I think that polymusicality that you cultivate in places other than, uh, than, than the conservatory will come in very handy in the school. Uh, does that answer? Well, we want to uh, continue the conversation out in our lobby with some light refreshments, and please come to our other open forums to continue this conversation. Let's thank Dr. Julia. And Andrea, I believe that it begins with the will. If you read Amy Gassman's work, she talks about why has there, hasn't there been greater change as, as far as racial equity um, in, in colleges and universities, and she says because there isn't the will. And that's something I think we need to think really long and hard about. Might be window dressing, but is the will really there? So. Okay. Of course.